sing, we're going to sing about the goodness of God. Has he been good to you? have found Matthew chapter 18 by now. If not, you can continue to look for that. The messages this week and next, I'll be with you today and next week as well, uh, are from a series that I developed back in 2017 when I pastored First Baptist Church of Warner. 
And I tell you that to say that they were messages for First Warner at the time, and today these messages have been recrafted for Crescent Valley Baptist Church, so this is not just a, a print it off and preach it kind of a thing. Uh, it is something that I believe that God laid on my heart as I struggled all week long with one message, and he laid on my heart this week, uh, make the switch. And he switched me to a message today that was so well received in our eight o'clock service, it blew my mind. It was a message that I believe is timely and a message that I think touches almost every soul, if not every soul, uh, in this room today. The focus behind each message was centered really on one thing. Stop trying to live your Christian life without Christ. That just doesn't even make sense, does it? But we do it, don't we? Oftentimes we just go through life and we're trying our best and we're doing our best and we're getting it done, but we're doing it without the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us to accomplish those things that we're trying to accomplish. And we're wrestling with significant situations in our life, whether it be depression or forgiveness or worry or fear or budget challenges or whatever, and we're doing so and we're leaving Jesus on the bedside where our Bible is. And so the challenge and the, uh, the focus of today's message and next week's message is to stop living like that. Stop making excuses why we couldn't or wouldn't do certain things because God is active and he's moving and he's working and it's our job to join him and to get busy with him and to live differently. And so the title of the sermon series that I, I preached back in 2017 uh, was The Power of We. The power of we. Today's message is the power of we forgive often. The power of we forgive often. Well, what does that mean? Here's where the we comes from. He, that's God, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, plus me equals we. He plus me equals we. And there's great power when, it, when you stop and consider the power of we. What can't we do with the Holy Spirit living in us? What can't we do with the Holy Spirit moving and working actively as we yield to him and we actively move as he is moving in our hearts and in our lives? Nothing is impossible with God and everything is impossible without God, but with God, all things are possible. And so the Holy Spirit living in us and working through us is this power that comes from partnering with the Holy Spirit and it removes every one of our excuses. Because many, many, many times we'll tell God, I just can't. You ever been there? Many, many times I'll tell God, I just can't. And when it comes to forgiveness, we'll tell God, we just can't. Am I right? We'll tell God, God, you just don't know. And he says, yes, I do. And so today I'm going to talk about the power of forgiveness. Today we're going to look at what it means to move from pathetic defeat to supernatural victory in our lives when it comes to forgiving others. It's not about being perfect. It's about the perfect one living in us and through us changing us, shaping us, molding us as we yield to him so that we can do something that's supernaturally impossible without him in us. I'm gonna tell you something. There's somebody right now that's struggling with forgiveness here today. There's someone right now that's struggling with the ability to forgive someone because of what they've done or what they haven't done, or what they did, or what they're already doing. And there's someone struggling with needing forgiveness for what they've done. And so I wanna challenge you today to listen and to lean in because God wants to move mightily. And as we saw in our eight o'clock service this morning, God really, really spoke to some hearts. God really, really, really touched a nerve into some lives where people are dealing with and struggling with what it means to forgive someone that's wronged you, what it means to forgive someone that's done something wrong to your family or to your, your income or whatever, what it means to be forgiven for doing something and messing up. And I'm gonna tell you, if you'll lean in and listen, that the power of the Holy Spirit's gonna move in a mighty way in your heart. It's not the preaching of my words, it's the power of the Holy Spirit working through the word of God as we're gonna see today. And by now you've found Matthew 18, hold your finger there, I don't want to ask you to move, but
But I want to read to you something that's going to set up Matthew 18. And it's out of the book of Colossians. You don't have to go there. I'm going to read to you from Colossians today. And Paul told the church at Colossae to keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is. To set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. We once walked that way and now we're different. I want to encourage you. You once lived in a way where you sought the man in the mirror each and every day. Where you sought the woman in the mirror each and every day. And that was your rule of thumb. That was your guidance. That was the best choice you had. But now you're a Christ follower. Now you know Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit lives in you. You've been forgiven and you've been changed. And you're being changed and being transformed each and every day that you allow the spirit to work in you and so what Paul says to the church at Colossae is you once walked that way now walk differently now live differently now behave differently my friends the world doesn't want you to forgive the world doesn't want you to receive forgiveness Jesus says I have a different plan for your life get on board with me in Colossians 3 12 and 13 if you're taking notes he says this so As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. That's strong, isn't it? As God forgave you, what's your yardstick for forgiveness? What's your measuring stick? How do you determine whether you should forgive someone or not? Just as God forgave you, that's how you're to forgive someone else. Ouch. You know why I said that? Because God's forgiven much where I'm concerned. How about you? God's forgiven much and God's forgiving much. I continue to make mistakes. Anyone else? I can continue to blow it in my spiritual life, in my personal walk, you name it as a husband, as a, as a father. And God continues to forgive. And God does something incredible when he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you and for me to forgive us of our sin. Christ, the sinless one, was nailed to a cross for my sin and for your sin, not for his sin. He was sinless. And he did so so that God would have the payment in full to be able to forgive you for all that you would do and all you have done. And my friends, that's powerful to set you free from the bondage of sin that sin brings to your life and in, in my life. And he did so to set you free. So the power of we, the Holy Spirit working in us plus us, he plus me equals we. So what's the yardstick? Forgive often. Well, how often? As often as you're given the choice. Did you catch that? How often you should you forgive? Notice I didn't say forgive always. But you, you guys just wouldn't even forgive always. I'm not doing that. Okay, forgive often. How often? As often as you're given a chance to forgive. Forgive. That ends up being always, but just, you know, just for those of you that are a little slow, thought I'd help you out there, okay? <laughs> Let's look at Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Verse 21 of Matthew chapter 18. We pick up the text. Then Peter came up and said to him, that's Jesus. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or maybe your passage says seven times 70. All right. Therefore, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished that count, to settle accounts with his servants. When we began to settle One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and bleated with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. 
And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, heavenly father, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for challenging us where this is concerned. And thank you providing the, for providing the victory that comes when forgiveness is needed and where forgiveness occurs. And I praise you for what you're going to do. Speak to us now through the power of the Holy Spirit and the printed word of God. In your name I pray. Amen. So we look at the text and we see what's going on here. And the disciples had been talking to Jesus about the kingdom of God. As we look all the way back to the beginning of verse uh, 1 of chapter 18, you find out that uh, the disciples were saying, Hey, God, please tell us what it looks like for the kingdom of heaven here. I wonder who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How, how uh, considerate of them to be concerned about that. And Jesus begins teaching them about the kingdom of heaven. And we need to realize that God's desire is for you and I to be Christ followers and live out the kingdom of heaven while we're here on planet earth. One of these days we're going to experience the kingdom of heaven in heaven, but he wants us to be the kingdom of heaven for those around us to see what it looks like to be with Christ followers. And so Jesus begins teaching them about these things and we need these things to be on earth as it is in heaven. And so he says, listen guys, you want to be great? Let me help you out. If you want to be great, be humble. If you want to be great, be a servant. If you want to be great, be the least among these. And it was flipping it on its head. Jesus was always doing that when it came to what the world saw was this and what we're to do is that. I'm going to tell you today, what the world would tell you where forgiveness is concerned is that you don't have to forgive. The world would tell you and give you an out that you don't have to forgive. Based on what someone did to you, that's so bad you don't have to forgive them. How about an easy out? That's not what the word of God said. That's not what the word of God says that we just read. And so Jesus gives us through this teaching to his disciples this incredible illustration as he was so good at doing. This incredible story uh, that really puts it in our ballpark so that we realize we're either going to um, understand this completely or we're going to be confused as to what we're doing. But the Bible isn't of confusion but of peace. So I want you to realize today that this story that we're about to read has many, many facets to it, but you're in this story today. I guarantee you, each and every one of you is in this story today. He continues preaching about the kingdom of heaven, and as we read a moment ago, Peter asked the question, hey, since we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, how often shall I forgive? Notice I threw the King James in there and said shall. Just, just for y'all that need King James. How often Will I forgive? How often should I forgive? How often shall I forgive my brother? He's looking for a number, isn't he? You ever done that? What's the least amount of something I can do that keeps me just on this side of sin? How close can I get and not just not really yet sin? It, is it this? Is it is it this? Is it, well, maybe if I can only do this. You see, that's the way we think. And that's the way Peter was thinking. So he goes, hey, seven's a perfect number. So I'm going to go with seven. So just, I just have to forgive my brother seven times. And you know, he's just thinking, I probably just said one too many, right? I, I should have asked for six. But he uses seven. Let me ask you something. How many of us have trouble coming up with one time to forgive someone? Any amens out there, oh me's, oh my. You see, I don't know that I would have come up with seven. I would have just said like maybe three because you don't want it to just be one because that's seeming like you're just like, well, okay. But stop and consider, there's someone in your life that you're right now struggling with forgiving just once. Forget seven times. There's someone in your life that you need to forgive you and you want them to forgive you. And you want them to forgive you just once and, and just be done with it. But they're sitting there going, nope, not going to do it. 
we're struggling, you're struggling, they're struggling with this challenge of forgiving someone or being forgiven by someone. And yet to forgive means that you're granting a pardon for the offense that occurred in your life. That they're granting you a pardon for the way that you've wronged them in their life. To cancel that debt, to release someone from what is owed. You see, when someone hurts you, they've taken something from you. They've taken maybe security from you. They've taken self-esteem. They've taken recognition. They've taken uh, dignity. Maybe even they've taken your, robbed you of your peace. I'm going to tell you something. I read about it in the paper all the time. I see it on the news all the time. And I've experienced it in my own life that there are people out there that are willing to rob you of your dignity and your peace and you name it for the rest of your life for their own personal pleasure and desire. Amen or not? And when that happens, that's it. I can't forgive them. I can't forgive that. I can't forgive that. Jesus addresses that today in our life. To achieve justice, there must be a transfer that's taken place. You've been hurt. There's an imbalance. Something must be transferred back to you, whether it be an apology or a favor or money or restitution. The tension is going to be uh, there until the debt is, seven, is settled. And that's exactly why Jesus Christ went to a cross and died for you. To remove that debt that you owed so that the tension would not be there. So that he could stand and tell them at that time. And he stands and tells us today, how often should you forgive someone? 70 times 7. Did he really mean that we're supposed to count up? Let's see, 70 times 7, that's 490. All right, I'm on 327 right now. Is that what he meant? No, it's hyperbole. He knew it would be an outrageous number because he's saying, how often should I forgive? And he says, forgive as often as you're given a chance to forgive, always. And you go, you just don't know, Jesus. And he says, yes, I do. Friends, listen, you might have stories. You might have circumstances. You might have happenings that you've dealt with. People have wronged you. Maybe you've wronged them. And they're not forgiving you. And you're in bondage, right? And you want them to forgive you, but they're not forgiving you. And what Jesus is saying here is stop living in bondage. I died so that you didn't have to live in bondage. And I want you to get this forgiveness thing settled once and for all. Because without the exchange, we're going to be in bondage. Without someone forgiving us, we're going to be in bondage. Without us forgiving someone else, we're going to be in bondage. They're going to be in bondage. And notice what he says in verse 21. My brother sinned against me. My brother sinned against me. That's person who is wrong. There's a limit to my forgiveness, Peter said. And Jesus, just give me a number. And as I mentioned earlier, the world, when it comes to numbers, is very, very low. You don't have to forgive. But Jesus lives totally and completely in something that, that blows my mind. is his forgiveness is unlimited. Have you found that out? You'll never run out of forgiveness from Jesus. Have you found that out? I love that fact. I'd be the guy who's sitting there counting up all the things that I've done wrong and wondered if I was used up all my forgiveness yet. My friends, he died on the cross so that you can have unlimited forgiveness, not so that you can go live an unlimited, unchained life. So we pick up the text as Jesus is telling the story in verses 23 through 25. It was time for the king to settle his accounts. And in this story, Jesus begins to put things in motion to where we'd see one thing and then we'd see something else. And I want you to pay attention to the story. As we've read it, now I'll walk through it and talk through it with you. One slave, owed, let's say 10,000 instead of talents, let's just use dollars. How's that? One slave owed him $10,000 to the king. It was undisputed, undeniable, and he was unable to pay. Now, that's a pretty significant debt. And I'm going to call the slave Marco. Is that okay? Is anyone in here named Marco? All right. No offense, but I'm just going to call the slave Marco because being the slave is just too anonymous for me. So Marco was unable to satisfy the debt, get his Lord... His king required everything. So what did Marco do? 
The Bible said that his king required everything, not just that he would be put in jail, would be sold as a slave, that his wife would be sold, his kids would be sold, and, and all of his stuff would be sold to raise money for what he owed him. Now, I don't know about you. It's one thing for you to uh, impose punishment on me. But when you start imposing punishment on my wife and kids, that's when things are a little bit different. That should have gotten Marco's attention. Stop and think about it. Some of you want to sell your kids and don't do it, okay? This is not an opportunity for you to go. We'll see here, it's, it's an opportunity to sell these kids. That's not what he's getting at. But where I'm concerned, I would tell you, it's one thing for me to withhold forgiveness because of something I did, but you start messing with my family and things are going to be different. Notice what's happened. He's taken, has everything taken away from him. So Marco the slave fell on his face slobbering. He prostrated himself on the ground. He pleaded for patience and he promised to pay. And what'd the king do? The king did something we never saw coming. He owed him $10,000. He had just told him he was going to sell him, his family, and his possessions. And he knew that in selling him, his family's possessions, there's no way on planet Earth he's even going to get close to the $10,000. But he's still going to do it anyway because somebody has to pay. There has to be a debt settled here. And yet he settles the debt. The king, out of pity, felt compassion. Compassion means a desire to alleviate suffering. He felt compassion on Marco and he chose to offer mercy to Marco and he released him from the bondage and he forgave him the debt. My friends, that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and for me when he was nailed to a cross. As he's being nailed to a cross in his wrists and in his feet, he's lifted up and he's lowered into the ground as hard as they could and he's jarred up there on the cross. And here they are spitting on him. Here they are hurling insults at him. He's saying what to them? You just wait. You just wait. And that's not what he said. As he's in the most pain ever, excruciating pain, dying a death he did not deserve for you and for me, he says what? Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, my friends, in his worst, Jesus was at his best. In our very best, we submit our worst. The king chose, chose to forgive the debt of Marco. Wouldn't you want a king? Wouldn't you want a Lord like Marco had? That when he looks at everything you and I have done, he says, you're forgiven. That's King Jesus. That's King Jesus. You and I, we've truly messed up. We've all done something wrong or done someone wrong. And we've, we're in shackles of fear and shame and bitterness and regret. And sometimes we don't want to give forgiveness to someone because they don't stink and deserve it, right? They don't. But that's not the yardstick. The yardstick is forgive often, always. That's the yardstick. Something's been done to you. It cannot be reversed, but it can be forgiven. You've done something to someone. You can't take it back. It can't be reversed, but you can be forgiven, and they can be forgiven. You can extend forgiveness, and you can receive forgiveness. I would want a king like King Jesus. Oh, if he would just forgive if he would just release my debt, if he would uh, release me from my bondage, the bondage of my past, I don't know about you, but I know so many that just want and are waiting to be released from the bondage of their past. Their past continues to haunt them and they're in bondage to their past. They need to be released from their past. They need to hear King Jesus say, you're forgiven from your past. It is covered by the blood that I shed on the cross for you. Your past no longer exists. I have removed it from you as far as the east is from the west. Oh, my friends, we need to be released from the bondage of our past. We need to be released from the bondage of past hurts. And we need to release others of the bondage that we're holding them in because we refuse to forgive them like our Heavenly Father forgives 
Uh, some of you today need to be released. Your debt erased. Some of you today need to be forgiven. I'd say Marco was a blessed man, wouldn't you? Marco was an incredibly blessed man when you stop to consider it. Free from his debt, free from his bondage. He owed a gob of money. He had a Lord of mercy who forgave him. And, and stop and consider, what's the largest debt that you owe? Let's say you own a business and, and for example, your business is awesome and you're, you're excited about it, but yet you owe a million dollars debt for that business. All right, that's understandable sometimes depending on the scope of a person's business. Think about that debt when someone comes up to you and says, I'm going to forgive you of that debt. What are you going to say? Giddy up, right? Do it immediately. I'm here. Sign the paperwork right now. That's exactly what we want to hear. You're forgiven of that debt. Woo, how would you begin to live at that point? Even if someone, you had a $150,000 note on your home and someone came and says, I want to pay off your home, I want to pay off all your credit card bills and I want you to live debt free. How would that change your life? And some of you are going, sign me up, right? That's exactly what happened to this man. He's been given freedom. Freedom from his debt Freedom from the potential of going to prison and being a slave. Freedom from his, his family being challenged. How did he begin to live? The Bible tells us that Marco, freed from his debt, being given everything, begins to think, ah, speaking of debts, come to think of it, little Johnny owes me some money. Now, every one of my sermons has to have little Johnny in it, okay? I'm just, that's just the name. If your name is John, my son's name is John, my brother's name is John, don't be offended by that. Little Johnny is in every one of my messages. So Marco had someone that owed him some money who happened to be named little Johnny, okay? Little Johnny owes me $100. So the Bible says, as Jesus is teaching this story and telling this story, that Marco realized little Johnny owed him some money. So what did he do to him? What would you do being a free man? What would you do as someone who's been forgiven freely? Well, surely you would just go ahead and pass on the grace. Surely you would just go ahead and freely forgive someone. Nope. We see in the text that Marco goes up to little Johnny. The Bible says he grabs him, he tackles him, and he chokes him. Pay back what you owe me. Pay back what you... It says it right there in the scripture. Marco is a violent man. What do you think Johnny did? He did the same thing Marco did. He begged for his forgiveness. He pleaded for patience. He promised to pay. And Marco was at the point that you and I are at here. Am I going to go ahead and forgive as I've been forgiven? Or am I still going to make this guy pay? Well, Marco chose the latter. Call the cops. Had him arrested. You're going to prison until this debt is satisfied. And Marco the free man put little Johnny into prison. Johnny was placed in bondage because Marco refused to forgive. Do you realize that's what you're doing to those around you when you refuse to forgive them? They've wronged you? No question. No question it was heinous. No question it was bad. No question it was ruthless. No question it was underhanded. No question they deserve wrath. So you're going to keep them in bondage because you're not going to forgive them. And yet you want your heavenly father to forgive you for everything you've done wrong and not have you in bondage. Do you see what Jesus is trying to get at here? Those who have been freely forgiven should freely forgive. Those who have been given much should give. Stop and consider where you are where that is concerned. Johnny had some friends who witnessed this and he he owed Marco, and, and Marco had him locked up, and Marco was just, just got off the, the, the hook for the bundle, and they said, you know what? 
We better let the king know that you just let Marco off the hook for a bundle of money, but Marco had this, this other guy locked up, and the king wasn't hearing it. Look in verse 32 of chapter 18. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. I set you free, he says. Why didn't you do the same? Friends, listen to me. If you are holding someone hostage in bondage, in bondage because you won't forgive them, why do you expect your heavenly father to forgive you? You say, Pastor Sam, you just don't know. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they did to my family. And to, to that I would say, yes, you're right. I don't know. But Jesus stands before you and says, I do. I know. Before you were even born, I know. I know what happened. I know what you went through. And I want you to forgive as I have forgived you. Here's the message from the king to Johnny or to Marco. I'm going to treat you like you treated others. And so Jesus cuts to the chase here. And he says, my heavenly father is going to treat you the same way as you've treated others. And you must forgive your brother. Notice what he says there in verse 35. How are we to forgive our brother? How are we to forgive someone that has wronged us from your heart. You remember growing up when you were a kid? Maybe you have kids today that do this. I doubt it, you know, kids, are, kids don't do this today. But when I was growing up in my household, um, I would do something wrong to my little brother or, or my little brother would do something wrong to me, which really happened more often than not, you know, um, just saying. Um, and what would my mom say? You tell him you're sorry. Sorry, no, you say it like you mean it. Sorry, that's not meaning it. You've got to say it like you really mean it. What was she trying to get at? You've got to be sorry from your heart. And all my little brother was doing was just saying something from his head, from his mouth. Oh, we never do that with Jesus, do we? Sorry, Jesus, yeah, I messed up again the third time this minute. Promised I wouldn't go look at that website anymore, but I did all day. Are you with me? Forgive as you've been forgiven. How? From your heart. Mean it. From the depths of your soul, get rid of that bondage that you are the one being held in bondage because you won't forgive someone. You're in bondage to the own grief that you're dealing with. Think of where you stand today. Do you need God to forgive you of something? Oh, we all do, my friends. We all need God to forgive us of something. And he wants to. He sent his son to die for you and for me. And when was the last time that you fell down prostrate before the Lord and pleaded with him that you were sorry and were remorseful for your sin and promised that you would go on a different path? When was the last time that happened? And if you did, did you choose a different path? Some of you here need your debt canceled and your debt forgotten. I want you to know God loves you. And God takes your sin seriously. And God has made a way for you to be freed. For you to ask for and accept the blood of Christ to cover you, to cleanse you, to set you free. In fact, the reality is this. I know in a room this large, there's some here that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There's some here that have never bowed their knee before God the Father and accepted God the Son as their Lord and Savior. And they're living a life that has never been truly forgiven by Jesus. Oh, he's forgiven you. You just haven't accepted it yet. He's brought salvation to you. You just haven't accepted it yet. So maybe today that's where you find yourself. 
God has made a way for you to be freed. Let me ask you something as we close. Who do you need to forgive this morning? Who do you need to forgive? You see, I think that's where most of us find ourselves. Not necessarily needing someone to forgive us, although it happens. But the reality for most of us, because the heart is wicked, we need to forgive someone. They've done something wrong. They've messed up. They've changed our lives. I just can't forgive them. You just don't know. You're right, I don't know, but Jesus does. And when we refuse to forgive, we stand in defiant disobedience to God. Did you know that? You may be refusing to forgive because it hurts so much. Jesus exchanged that pain for your joy when he died on the cross to cover you, to cleanse you, to free you. We want forgiveness, but oftentimes we don't want to forgive. And when we do, we stand in defiance to God. Lay that at his feet today. Place it in his arena. Talk to him about what happened to you. Talk to him about how someone wronged you. Take that prayer to the feet of Jesus and cast your care on him because he cares for you and leave it there and quit picking it back up. Quit holding that grudge. Quit playing that game. Lay it at the feet of Jesus. Let him solve this problem in your life, but you forgive as Jesus has forgiven you. And each of you just as it says right here, must forgive from your heart. My friends, you can't do forgiveness lip service and it do any good in your life and in my life. Lip service is just what it was for your parents. It was just that. They knew that you weren't telling the truth. When I was raising my kids, I knew they're not telling the truth. They just wanted to get off scot-free and say, I forgive you, but really didn't mean it. My goal was for them to forgive one another to clean the slate so that their relationship could be pure and holy again. That's God's goal for you. You get ready to forgive someone, I want to give you some things to think about and then we'll go. First of all, be prayed up. Be prayed up. You'll never forgive someone with a right heart unless you're prayed up. Let God get right with you. Reach out. Here's what I mean by that. Do you know what? Someone may have done something so heinous to you or done something so wrong to you that you're never going to speak to them again. And I get it and God gets it. Okay? Forgiveness doesn't mean that you need to be best buds and homeboys. But you find an empty chair. You find something. Because the reality is the, forgive, the unforgiveness lies in your heart. It has nothing to do with them. And you forgive them. You get prayed up and then you reach out. Whether it's an empty chair or it's face to face. And you reach out and you let go. And when you let go, you leave it with God. And you don't take it back. And you mean it from your heart. And when you do, your healing's going to begin. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over time. But the, the, when you get to that point that you let that go your healing's going to begin. Let me give you something that I found so helpful for me. I found that it's helpful in my life, something that happened to my family, something that, that brought me great anger and great distress and, and something that challenged me deeply. And I found that in order to forgive uh, what happened, to f forgive this individual that I had to go through a process. Let me give you this process real quick and then we'll go. If you'll just lean in and listen just for a few more minutes. is for me, the process was to be able to say out loud to the empty room, out loud to the uh, cars I'm driving down the road, but not to this person. Uh, because once again, I don't believe that God always intends for you to have to face somebody that's done you wrong or done your family wrong uh, to a certain degree. But what I did was I said, I forgive you. I forgive you. And in doing so, that was the beginning, not the end. That was the beginning of forgiveness. I forgive you. 
It was the beginning of the process of forgiving. You see, because when you say, I forgive you to someone, whether it be to an empty chair or to their face, you've told them that you've done business with God. But you're in the process that happens for quite a while of forgiving them. I've forgiven you. You didn't say that. You said, I forgive you. I forgive you. I'm forgiving you so that there will be a point in time when you and your heart can get so right with God that you can say, you're forgiven. Do you see the progress? I forgive. I'm forgiving. You're forgiven. I forgive. I'm forgiving. You're forgiven. And oh, my friends, that process, it just depends on how long and how deep the hurt. But I'm going to tell you, if you'll do that, when you say, I forgive you, you leave it at the feet of Jesus and life will be incredibly different. And what it's going to show you is the power of what it looks like, the power of we. That when you take that hurt and you couple it with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, the power of he plus me equals we and you'll have the power to forgive you'll have the power to reach out and be forgiven and you'll have the power to go through life with your head up and your chin high that your past is gone removed as far as the east is from the west because you've been forgiven you've been set free and you can live for Jesus and love others and set them free just as you have been set free